Okay, we're live. All right, thank you very much, Katie. And uh, welcome everyone to our mental health series from the Novi Public Library. Today's topic will be, how are the kids? And I'm really excited about this subject. Um, it's very different and very necessary um, as we are dealing with this pandemic. It's been, seems like forever, um, but we will get through this. I'm so glad to have our guests joining me this evening. We have our series guest, professional Dr. Crystal Jackson, who is a licensed professional. Thank you for joining me again, Dr. Jackson. Hi, thank you so much for having me again, Gail. Absolutely, for sure. And our special segment guest joining us is a licensed, licensed social worker. And we have almost doctor, that's what I'm allowed to call you, Kristen Kennard. And um, I'm saying almost because we have what, just a few more months before we can officially say doctor, is that right? Yes, yeah, just into the middle of next year. And mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a, prof a licensed professional counselor. But I've done licensed, social work too. I'm sorry, licensed yeah. professional, correct me, licensed professional counselor. Very good. Yeah. I'm so glad we're here. And um, we are going to jump right into talking about the conversation of how are the kids. Um, I offer you, we also have Katie. She's my coworker. She's helping me with technology. So if you have any questions or comments, you can type them in the chat if you're on Zoom. And if you are live with us on Facebook, you can type them in the comments section. And um, Katie will relay the questions to us and we can address them anyway along the program. Um, we're asking you to be interactive with us as we talk about helping our kids through this. Um, they are gonna get through it. Sometimes I think they're a little bit stronger than the parents are, but we won't admit that, will we? <laughs> um, let's talk about it. Our flyer talks about we're gonna cover everything with them dealing with stress, isolation, distraction, sadness, quietness. Um, depression is a, a big issue. And I also added regression because I've been seeing that as a, an issue as well. So um, we can just really start anywhere. And let's talk about um, how they're dealing with motivation. I've been seeing even through many newscasts how motivation levels are down, um, just everything. I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Jackson. Let's talk about um, what are we seeing with many of our kids now? Well, I think one of the, I think a good starting point is to define or clarify exactly what we're talking about today, because I think it's not just about how are they doing with the pandemic during this COVID-19 um, pandemic that we're in, but is there, I think, a, I think another more specific question is, are they responding to the pandemic itself, like uh, where, what may be the potential fears that's there? So are they concerned about the virus? Are they concerned about the government regulations? Are they concerned more about the social aspects? So I think that when we say, how are the kids during the pandemic? I feel like there's so many different components that we can address that probably has been impactful to children during this time. I know that there was a recent study um, done in maybe October, like late October of this year, and they did a research about the reaction of children based on those three components that I just talked about, that I just mentioned. And I think tonight, that we, if we can, if we're able to expand on that and really allow for a conversation to take place that focuses on those three different areas um, and the signs and symptoms that parents, or even if there's teenagers listening right now, can be aware of that would, that would maybe helpful and be informative and educating to them so that they know when to reach out, right? Like what's within normal limits, what's outside of normal limits of how we respond and how we adjust to change and transitions because there's been a lot of that this year. Exactly, that's uh, Kristen, would you like to comment on that part? Sure, or any no, way you'd like I, to start? Sure, um, I, I agree with Dr. Jackson for sure. You know, being able to identify the signs um, of behavior changes with our children right now is really important. Um, I know that stress, we all have it, I think at this point, you know, parent to child alike. But for our children, 
they're oftentimes, you know, when they're stressed and because they have school and they're able to get out and play and work all of these things out, um, they tend to fare better. But because of the isolation that you mentioned earlier, um, there are certain things that we just have to look out for. Um, so any, any type of stress um, that might be affecting their eating, um, um, irritability, you know, crying, things like that, um, poor attention span. And then even for um, some other children, I know Dr. Jackson just mentioned, or you mentioned about regression, you know, going back to former behaviors like bedwetting, things like that, avoiding bedtime. So, so it's really important, I think, what would be really helpful in this conversation is really to help parents identify signs of stress, um, signs of, um, of uh, the child avoidance, you know, things like that with our children. Uh, again, the irritability, the not being able to focus, having difficulty during their school time. How do we identify that? And then what are some suggestions for managing those behavior changes? Do we see what the differences are between younger people and their response? Um, maybe elementary school, middle, high school, are there any differences or um, it just depends? How can we talk about that? Because I know teenagers, sometimes they don't so show signs as obviously, but, and I guess little ones either, it, it's just depends. My teenager is a little more quiet. Um, some, you can obviously tell if there's a change if they go from way up high to way down low. So what can we talk about with our teenagers and high school ages? I think one thing that, and, and I think I think it's necessary to say this is that we are, even with the, having this conversation, we are making an assumption when we talk about regression, we're making an assumption that parents were previously aware of their child's <laughs> normal behavior pattern, right. <laughs> right? Because you won't notice regression if you were not aware of what was pre-existing, right? Mm. So I, I think I just wanted to put that out there. Yes, <laughs> it, it's hard. It's hard to tell if you're if you're not aware of what was already happening before the pandemic hit. So if we go on the assumption and moving forward in this conversation, believing that parents were aware of their children's behavior and mood, and, and especially dealing with teenagers, um, understanding that there are already uh, just some changes naturally that occur, even without the pandemic being in place. So I think what, what would be a sign and symptom um, that there may be something going on worth being concerned about. It's really anything that is significantly different than what was pre-existing. So that's why I started out that, that, that my answer that way. Whatever is significantly different than what was pre-existing. So for some people, they're naturally quiet. However, when they are feeling anxious or nervous, they may talk more or the speech is pressured or they can't seem to stop talking or ruminating over the same concept over and over and over and over and over again. The parent may feel like, well, didn't we just have this conversation? And it's clear to the parent that that conversation was not sufficient to the child because there's worry that's still there, which is what's prompting them to repeat the same questions or ask the same questions over again. Um, so that would be a sign. On the flip side, if your child is naturally talkative and outgoing and you see them begin to regress and turn inward, maybe isolating more, more withdrawn and to themselves, then that would be a sign, again, that maybe there's something more going on than what you would consider to be within normal limits. Because I think that for everyone, there is, there is this adjustment period that we all went through with mm -hmm. the pandemic, but with, but with teenagers particularly, Gail, you asked a question about what's the difference between the young like elementary age and the teenagers. So I think as humans, regardless of age, in general, generally speaking, we, we crave human interaction. Now, if you're dealing with a person who was already dealing with high anxiety levels or social anxiety, right? You may find that they are 
so much better mm. because now, because now that this, this trigger mm. or this stressor of being in social environments that's been removed. Right. So there's no more pressure for them to go out and to socialize. So they're in their homes. They're very comfortable. They're content with their environment. And so you may sometimes you can you can mistakenly believe that they have improved and they're getting better when actually that is the, the pandemic may have reinforced the, the anxiety and, and the need for isolation. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not really improvement in that case. It is definitely an issue of regression. I think that the difference between the younger children and the older children based on research is, 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 is that it shows that during the teenage years, as I mentioned earlier, across all ages, we crave human interaction. But in the teenage years, so much of their identity is caught up in their social network. Mm -hmm. And so when that is removed, like it has been, it's, it's, it's been, it's been altered significantly. I think that's one of the biggest differences between the two age groups that you mentioned, the elementary and then, you know, maybe the middle school, high school age group is that their identity for the younger children, it's not caught up in social interactions. They have fun with their social interactions. They enjoy playing together, but the identity piece isn't caught up in that yet. A lot of their identity is still based on the home setting that happens in their immediate environment. Got it. Mm -hmm. What about- um, yeah, yeah. Sure. No. no, I was gonna add to that and say that um, definitely along with the identity piece is also learned behavior. And so when we're looking at our children, some of the major differences I think we would see between the younger and the older ones is coping style mm -hmm. in some instances. You know, many times we don't look at how our children cope with stress and cope with adversity. Um, and that's also something else that a parent can miss and not really have attended to very early on. Um, so understanding how our children uh, handle stressful situations, uh, how they cope when they're uncomfortable. Um, are they comfortable being uncomfortable and do they know how to problem solve through those, you know, when there's a, a, a difficult challenge for them. Um, and so even as parents, you know, our children from the youngest to the oldest, they learn the coping style often by watching the parent. It's the environment that they've grown up in, right? That they typically have learned the style. So where we don't always know how much our children are watching us, they are learning how to cope with stress, adversity, any kind of challenge based on how we model as parents. Um, another thing that I wanted to add to that in terms of signs and symptoms is that everything doesn't always manifest as you know just anxiety or depression. It may manifest in physical symptoms. So that's something else to look out for with our children if they're, you know, stomach aches, uh, reoccurring headaches, um, just, just body aches in general. Often, uh, you know, research shows us as well that anxiety and depression often cause these things. So, in, and we see a lot of research as it relates to adults, but it's, it's, it's the same with children. So we need to make sure that we're asking our children, how are you feeling physically? Are there any physical symptoms? Are they having difficulty eating, keeping down a meal? You know, so things like that are also important to attend to during, how during you, the- uh, What would you suggest? How often should a parent uh, ask their children how they're feeling? I think maybe when this all occurred in the beginning, in the first month or two, we were all, you know, you okay, everybody okay? And now it's, I don't want it to become the norm where we just totally think everyone's used to it by now when it, it could be becoming you know, more anxious for children or maybe less, or when do you bring this up or do you bring it up? Because often children won't. So is it up to the parent to say, hey, you still doing okay? Or what do you recommend there? You know what? I, I'm, I'm glad that you added on that last piece when you said, hey, are you still doing okay? I would, I would say not to use that phrase. Okay. Mm -hmm because that phrase in and of itself is like a prompting for a person. It's almost like, 
how 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 we greet each other and we say hi how are you and the automatic response that we all give is fine i'm fine fine how are you <laughs> yes we say it without even giving giving a second thought to that that answer most people okay mm -hmm. there's always exceptions right to the things that we talk about but generally speaking that's what happens and so when we ask questions and we unconsciously insert the answer for the other person, it's very likely that they will just pick that up and they'll just spit it right back out to you, right? Mm -hmm. So are you still okay? Yes, I am. Because they're assuming that that's what you want to hear because of the way that you phrase the question. Mm -hmm. So even with me saying this, I feel like I can hear people I think I say this oftentimes, Gail, in these series, I, I feel like I can hear people, you know, talking back to me already um, because it's such an unnatural way of speaking, I think sometimes um, that, that we have to be very intentional. Parents would have to be very intentional. If you know that you don't normally speak that way or you normally ask questions with the answers kind of embedded in the question already, so to do what mm -hmm. I'm asking or suggesting, it's going to be very different. It may even feel awkward, um, but I think it's beneficial because then you leave it open ended. So you're open to any response that your child wants to give and your child feels comfortable giving a response without feeling like they're being led or they're expected to, to, to provide a certain answer or to say a certain thing. So when you ask the question about, well, how often do you check in? I think that there is that balance, that fine line of the check, a person can check in daily by just saying, hey, how are you doing today? And that for some families are, that's really a part of their everyday life anyway. They, the kid, if, if the children were in school, like physically in school, and they were out the home going into classes. And some parents, when they pick up their children or their children come home, if we're talking about teenagers, they may automatically, the parents may automatically say, so how was your day today, right? It's a very common phrase or question that's used from day to day in some households. Mm -hmm. So if that was your norm, I would say to continue the norm. If mm -hmm. you normally ask your children from day to day, at the end of each school day, how they were doing, I would say continue to do the same thing during the pandemic. No need to change that now. If you did not normally do that, I think the concern would be that if it's outside of your norm as a parent, now the child may become worried, like why do you keep asking, why, why do you keep asking me this question? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> should I not be okay? Like, should I be okay? So they can become a little concerned. So I would say, um, not to uh, not, not to operate too far outside of what is normal, but I, I do think that periodic check-ins, maybe every so many days. And the reason I say that too is because teenagers, especially more so than younger children, they have access to the internet. And so their belief about something, their experience, their feelings, their emotions, how they're conceptualizing what's happening, it can change from day to day depending on how much access they have to the internet, like how much they utilize their access, right? Because we know how we feel as adults. Some adults, if they're watching the news all the time, their emotions fluctuate with the information that's on the news, right? Mm -hmm. So in therapy, we would, yeah. I think most therapists would try to guide the client away from watching it all day, right? Uh, maybe they pick a time that they watch it. But with children, I think that checking in with them every so often is really healthy, but also having open, very innocent conversations about limiting their time with access to the internet, even if it's, even if it's um, for so many hours a day, just having some type of guide and making sure that, hey, you know, I empathize, validate, I know you're concerned, right? I know you're curious about what's happening, but I think that maybe we could talk about this within our family versus you just watching, right? And kind of being dumped on by the media 
every day, all day about what's happening. So that would be a healthy approach, right? To having the conversation about how are you? And sometimes even if, if, you, if you have naturally had a very open relationship with your child and they know that they can come to you, um, that's hugely beneficial. If not, then maybe start to practice that, right? So maybe you're just simply saying to your child, okay, so just wanna let you know that I'm here. I know there's a lot going on, right? Just being very matter of fact, there's a lot going on. I just want you to know that I'm always here to listen, right? Mm -hmm. No matter how you're feeling, no matter what your thoughts are, just know that I'm here, okay? Did you wanna talk about anything? And they may say, no, okay, well, just if it changes five minutes later, just come, you know, and let me know, right? So just making sure that you're being I like very that. Open. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. very open, not pushy. You're not trying to make it an issue if they don't really have an issue. But I think just having that very open, casual conversation is important. I like that a lot. Okay. If you do recognize, and this is for Kristen, if you do recognize something going on with your child, do you bring it up specifically to the child? And do you make the association as to what you think it is? Is it related to the pandemic? How do you address if you notice differences within your child? Either. Well, I always say it, and I have children that are older. I have a 18 year old and, and a 22 year old, which is not quite a child, but I always say, be curious, you know? Um, and then also you have to attend to yourself before you begin to ask these questions. Because sometimes as a parent, when you sense that something's wrong with your child, depending on how you cope, your anxiety is through the roof. Your stress goes through the roof and your children pick up on that, right? So they're not necessarily uh, knowing what might be wrong with you, but they can sense something. So, you know, you before you're engaging in that kind of conversation, you're gonna wanna really tend to yourself and, and we can talk about self-care for parents a little bit later, um, but be curious with your child um, and, and be honest. You know, um, saying something like, you know, I've noticed um, you, you used to love uh, going outside and I haven't really seen you doing much of that. You know, I wonder what that is, you know, mm -hmm. instead of why are you not going outside? Why is such a loaded, <laughs> it's just so <laughs> loaded. And so immediately when you use why, even as adults, we know we're adults. And when somebody asks you, why aren't you doing something or why are you acting like this? there's the sense of defensiveness that automatically comes up. And, it, and so it is with our children. So whether you're dealing with younger children or even our teenagers, you know, be curious about um, what you think, what you think they may be feeling. Um, give them an opportunity to answer the question. You know, um, sometimes if we're thinking, oh, my child is anxious because many parents are listening to us and they're reading different things and they're watching uh, television and gaining a lot of information or bringing it in from a lot of different directions, you know, to be able to just, you know, take a moment to sit back and say, how do I really want to say this? So if you've heard the term anxiety, sometimes people don't really know what that means. So if you're saying, you know, you know, it seems like, you know, if they say, well, I'm, I'm worried, that, that might be anxiety. In, in, a, in a more extreme form, but for children, they may not use those words. I mean, I'm anxious, I'm depressed. They may say, I'm feeling a little sad um, because I can't see my friends or I, um, I feel um, worried that I'm gonna get sick, you know, those kinds of things. So you wanna ask your questions in a way that your children um, use their own language for responding and not you know, some of the, the more clinical terms that we know to use with them. Um, also, you know, when you're talking with your children, um, some of them are gonna have a lot of questions. And we know what we have seen in media. And if our children have access to it, you know, I have older kids, like I said, so, you know, they're at this age to question and to challenge and to bait. Well, you know, they say we really don't need to wear masks, you know, but you know, those kinds of things, you, you have to be prepared for that. And one way of preparing is being able to say, I don't know. There are just some things that we just don't have the answer to for this. And so when we're talking to our children, be open to their questions um, and also be prepared to say, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have to be able to, um, you know, make sure we make the environment a comfortable environment for that questioning. 
Um, I think uh, Dr. Jackson was mentioning earlier that some of us, you know, this is new for a lot of families. Maybe, maybe you've never had that time where you sat down and talked to your children. Um, maybe when you're doing something that, that where it's not so um, threatening to them, right? You can't just get all upset with them and, you know, they've just gotten in trouble. Mm -hmm. And then 10 minutes later, you want to talk about, is this about COVID? You know, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you don't want to, you don't want to do it that way. Um, but, but because I, as a parent and, and just having a real consciousness about how we deal with our children, you know, I, and I have to say this, we have to deal with our own concerns first. You know, and I say that as a mom, you know, I'm used to being the one and being there and being supportive and showing the strong support and the resiliency for my children. But during this time, many of us have never been here before. We've just not been in this place. And so um, it's good as parents, even before you start this whole inquiry with your child, take a good look at where you are. You know, how are you coping? How are you managing? Who do you talk to? Do you, are you taking in the news all day, right? Because many of us are at home, uh, we're working from home. We may have more free time on our hands than we've had before. So we really need to do some self-care around our management of COVID and being isolated and being relegated to either just grocery shopping or something else that, you know, we, we, we can do with our eyes closed. But, but again, at this moment, Many of us are challenged in, in, in ways that we've never been challenged before. So to be able to attend to ourselves first, you know, see if we need help, right? You know, before, with, with all of this. Um, is it affecting us physically? Um, couples, you know, moms and dads, how is it affecting you? You know, our children, they're soaking in it in everything just as we are. So to be able to really tend to yourself first and then take you know the time to really engage your child will be much helpful, um, so that you're you're not um, giving them the wrong impression about why you're inquiring, like leading them to think that there should be something wrong, right? So so I think that you know just being open, being transparent. If you're afraid, it's nothing wrong. I don't think saying to your child, yeah, I you know, I, I know exactly what that feels like. You know, I've been afraid a little bit too. Mm -hmm. and explain why. So the transparency, uh, I call it just being real, you know, with your kids and being able to say, hey, I don't know how this is all going to turn out, um, but we can make it through this together. And I think both of you have addressed the transparency. My question is, and maybe you've already answered it, how transparent should you be if you are in a situation where you don't even know how you're gonna make ends meet. I mean, you know, many are there. You don't know how you're gonna make ends meet. And when children ask mommy, daddy, why are you home when you should be at work? And it could be because you no longer have a job or it could be because you're working from home. You know, the multiple reasons as to why could be very, very serious at this point. Um, how much of that or how do you answer uh, a child if they ask or even if they don't when you're in a, in a desperate place right now? I would say the way to answer that is the same way you would answer um, any other question that um, a child asks. Um, you answer it to the point of them, one, being able to understand your answer. So you, 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 you answer the question in, in an age appropriate manner. Um, and then you answer it to the point where it's satisfactory to the child. Right. So the so if you can provide an answer and the child just simply says, oh, OK, right. Done. You're finished. Job done. Don't continue the conversation. No need to elaborate. Right. Mm -hmm. They were satisfied. They gave you the OK. They walked away. They continued to do whatever else they were doing. You're good. I think that um, if they if, if, if they continue to probe. I would say answer in a way that lets them know that you and or dad, right? Um, depending on how many parents are in the household, that you and or the other parent is working on it. That's for them to worry about, right? That's for me to worry about. That's for dad to worry about. I just want you to be concerned about this. We are taken care of. 
if there is a concern big enough for you to know about, I promise I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. Right? So you are very clear cut. You're not lying to your children. You're not making things out to be better than what they really are. But you're also not over disclosing information to your children when they can do nothing about the answer you give anyway. And because doing that leads to a sense of heightened stress, increased worry, feelings, potential, potentially, I should put that word out there because it's not a guarantee, but potentially th that could be the result. When you present information to a person that is out of their control, that's not a good feeling for anyone of any age. Now, as adults, at times, we are faced with those situations, but there is no need to extend that stress, extend that worry over to your children. So I think that you can, most loving, caring parents can confidently say and honestly say, we're working on it. It's not for you to worry about it. I know that I'm working from home, right? Mm -hmm. We have things under control. And if, again, if there is a time where we see that things are changing for our family to the point where it will impact you or our household or our way of living, we will always let you know, right? And that can provide some safety, especially if the child, again, we're, we're dealing with a lot of assumptions, especially if you normally have in your household a very open, honest, trusting, safe, secure, filling environment, um, then the children will hear that from you, they'll trust you, and they will just move on more mm -hmm. often than not. Okay. There's a question um, coming in from Facebook. It says, uh, what do you advise if you find that your child has fallen into depression, minor or serious? What, what do you do? There's no minor depression. I shouldn't have ordered it that way. <laughs> well, I think if, they, if, you, if you have... So another assumption here. So if that quite, if the, we're not face to face. So I would ask, I would like to ask the person who asked that question, are you thinking that your child has fallen into depression or did your child come to you and acknowledge how they were feeling? So I, because I think the answer to that question would lead me to give two different answers, maybe. Um, my answer is going to say, I think my child has fallen into depression. Okay. Then? So if I think my child has fallen into depression, I would sit down and talk to my child, not even using the word depression, because labels are powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't want a child to over-identify with a label because the, the concern that you have as a parent is bigger than a label of depression. Your concern is if your child is not eating, you want them to eat. You're not really concerned about the label, right? If your child is not sleeping, you want to help them get rest. You're not really concerned about the label. If your child is vomiting, you just want the stomach to be soothed. You're not concerned about the label. So I would say assess what the symptoms are and then go from there, right? So you're talking to your child, depending on the severity here, you're talking to your child about how they're feeling. And I think it really goes back to what Kristen mentioned earlier, which is a lot of curious, inquisitive questions to get your child to feel comfortable to open up and speak. So I noticed this, can you tell me about this, right? I noticed that, can you tell me about, I noticed you haven't been eating. Can you tell me how, are you, how you have been feeling? I noticed, so a lot of, a lot of those questions, a, a lot of, of the, I noticed this, so tell me this, right? Help me understand. Um, I think that's the very first thing. And then once you go through those symptoms and you, and you, and you have that conversation with your child, if you believe you can resolve it, right? Because sometimes 
the person's the child has just been holding in so much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they have not released any of their emotions i will even as a psychologist i will say and i have told people sometimes if as a parent you allow your child to be open with you 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 never even need me <laughs> that's true mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes it works that sometimes it works that way i remember telling a, a couple um that that statement and they called me for assistance and we had a brief consultation over the phone and um i that was my first my first step for them was not to set an appointment with me even though that's why they were calling my first step after hearing their story, my first step was to tell them, okay, just allow your child to say any and everything, give them permission, right? So things that maybe you would otherwise not allow your child to say, just say you have free reign and I am here to listen and take it in, right? And I said, just call me back and let me know if you still need me after that happens. And they called back and they said, I, I think we're good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't like they they they're fine they they just needed to express themselves right and so i would tell the parent not to worry not to jump too fast to make a decision um about medication sometimes parents you know just like with the common cold they're really sometimes if again going back to gail's statement if we don't have our own emotions in check we can find ourselves overreacting to things um, that can be easily resolved Okay, so so I would say have the conversation, ask the, ask the inquisitive questions, allow for time for them to answer, and then see if you can resolve it at home. See if there's see if they need to do like this 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 kind of emotional um, letdown. So like if they can just emotionally let go, release um, a lot of what they're thinking and feeling, and see if that helps. Then if you notice that it has continued, maybe beyond two weeks or so right? Then I would say, okay, talk to them about how they feel because maybe they don't feel very comfortable talking to you as their parents. Sometimes that happens, but you always want to ask. I think teenagers, it's so important that we ask and that we include them as much as possible in their own self-care and that we don't try to just take control and do what we think is best because we can, we can, it can end up backfiring, you know, on us. Um, so allow them to have some control about, you know, what move is next and what they think will be best for them. I think both scenarios were kind of answered in what you said, but suppose your child says, mom or dad, I'm depressed. I'm very depressed and I don't know why. I think it's the pandemic or I think it's I'm missing my friends or I think I don't know what it is. And what do you do then? And either can answer Kristen or uh, Dr. Jackson. Well, well, what I'd say is, um, as a therapist, I also don't want to make this assumption that a parent automatically has the capacity to answer that question, right? So sometimes this, it might be just too much for us to address with our child um, because we are in the, the season of virtual visits and, and we can see our providers anytime we want. As a parent, I'd say if you're feeling overwhelmed with that, reach out to your, their, their primary care provider right? Go ahead and schedule a virtual visit. You can be right there um, and, and, and let that child, depending on their age in, in terms of you being there or not, but be there with that child and let the provider who is often trained, and I'm saying primary care initially, right? Because you don't know, is this really some kind of deep depression? Is it something else? But to normalize even just seeking, you know, healthcare support when you're in this kind of space. So, to be able to reach out to your provider, um, schedule an appointment, you know, where they can sit there and maybe let them ask some of the questions that maybe you don't know how to ask or answer um, would often be a, a good way to, to, you know, handle that situation. Um, also, um, you mentioned it a little bit, Gail, that we can't assume that the depression or the low mood or whatever they're experiencing is because of COVID. It could be something totally outside of COVID. And now the fact they could have been feeling like this for a really long time. And because they're home, they're, you know, everyone's around, um, they're not able necessarily to, to um, hide it the way that they may have been able to do it before, 
right? And, and so we're home, everybody's kind of seeing each other all the time. And so you may see these things and then children, again, it could also be just a relief that they don't have to hide it anymore. So, you know, um, I think for parents and, and, and Dr. Jackson mentioned all of the other ways to really address it, if you choose to address it, but I also want parents to know that um, it's okay not to feel like that you can address something on that level. That is why we're here. But again, we, you know, if you can resolve it, great. If you can't reach out to a professional um, just to help navigate that discussion with your child. I notice a lot of uh, young people, uh, teenagers, uh, high school and college, I hear them expressing themselves about grades dropping uh, significantly because of this. Um, what, what do you do then? I, I also know of a few parents who said their kids will no longer pay attention to the Zoom learning and the whatever, you know, the whole technology thing. They can't get their child to even sit in the chair long enough to watch that. And, and it's making their grades drop to even the point of failure. Um, one, you're not alone, so don't feel that way because um, I hear that quite often and I'm sure you all do as counselors and psychologists. What do you tell parents then? And what do you do with your child in the moment when they're, they just don't wanna pay attention to that? You know, there's Make a learning them. curve with all. Well, yeah, I do. My, my 18 year olds, that's, that's a different story. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> I understand what you're saying. So you say, sit down um, there and you you're know, gonna listen while you're there. Well, or do you, you know, say, okay, I don't step really back. Get, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> they cut the apron strings off of me a long time ago. They, you know, but, but again, you know, it is, it's an age thing. And some, some children, it's a fact, some are just more resilient than others, right? It, it, it's, it's not um, anything to feel bad about. Some of our children may struggle a little bit more than others. I struggle at times, you know, having to be, you know, utilizing this mode of communication all the time. So of course, our children who are used to being in a brick and mortar, brick and mortar space, you know, things are organized and structured and their peers are around and they have someone right before them. Um, this is, a, is absolutely foreign to them for a learning atmosphere, typically for most of our children. Um, there's a term out now that they're using called Zoom fatigue. You know, and how many of us can say that that we experience some sense of fatigue of utilizing this technology day, you know, for five, six, seven, eight hours a day. So um, when our children, you know, there there are going to be some challenges as it relates to schoolwork. Parents have to be engaged. I don't care what the age is, because sometimes we can assume our older children are okay with this. Oh, because they use their phones and they're, you know, used to engaging with social media and technology all the time. This is a slightly different animal for some of them. And it just depends on how your school is engaging with your child. Are they, is it synchronous or asynchronous, right? You know, are they seeing a live person? Or are they just getting their assignments listed on a, a, a white page on a screen and said, this is what you do and you turn it in. Um, I think again, this also maybe reduces a little bit for some children, the lack of confidence that they have because teachers may not engage via this technology the same way that they do in the classroom or they, you know, they may be calling on students, but there's just a different energy in a classroom. You know, and I think we all know that, you know, having been in school and things like that. So there's a different energy when you are in person, right? Like if we were all in a room together right now, I'm sure there would be a different energy mm -hmm. than what we have here. And so children feed off of that. That energy can motivate them, right? Um, it can also push them to, to, to want to succeed in that space for some kids. And so to be so isolated, um, yeah, it, it can create the problems that, that we see with some, definitely with grade dropping. Again, we teachers get paid to do what teachers do, reach out to their teachers, right? You're a parent, we, we are teachers, yes, with our children, but from an instructional perspective, some of us are challenged. I've talked to parents, like, I don't know this math. What am I supposed to do, <laughs> right? And, and, and the teacher's not there, it's just an assignment up on a, on, a, on a screen for them to do. So, you know, reach out to 
the educational professionals. Reach out to yeah. that teacher. Um, parents also, maybe if your child is not intimidated by it, that maybe you can sit somewhere in the room where they are learning, not on screen, especially for older kids. You know, if they're doing poorly, you don't want to be like, I'm sitting in the class with you and sitting in the chair next to them on the screen. You know, um, engage them gently. Um, but again, you still want to reinforce uh, good stewardship over their work, you know, good study habits and all of those different things. So where we may not necessarily want to make our children feel bad for maybe not performing well, we still want to encourage them to continue with behaviors that will afford them good grades. So still being able to study, you know, mm -hmm. you can't have the distractions on in your room for some kids, maybe TV and things that are accessible to them at home that are never accessible to them in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just creating the atmosphere for learning and for success, um, is, it will be really important. But yeah, I think everybody, it, it, it just depends on the child, um, how well they're going to do, but there are tons of resources available now since we've been able to, since we've had to uh, transition to this type of learning. So I would say take advantage of those as well as the, the professionals who are there to help your child succeed. And all praise to teachers and educators <laughs> everywhere because I know you were not set out to do this at all and you all are doing a fabulous job with managing this. In addition to managing your own households, um, our next uh, mental health series session will cover supporting frontline workers and educators. So please don't feel attacked at all because, you know, we we got you. We understand we're supporting you as you support our children. I Absolutely. did want to throw that, that out there. I'm glad you tossed that out there, Gail. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to mention the next series that's coming up. Yes. <laughs> I, I wanted to also piggyback on what Kristen mentioned about, yes, reaching out to the, the school, the teachers, um, the same way in which you would if your child, if you felt your child was underperforming and they were physically in the classroom. That's what we would do normally. We would send an email. We would try to schedule an appointment with the teacher to discuss what the challenges are. And we would try to discuss a, a game plan, right? We wanna create resolution. So what do we think is gonna be best for this child knowing, right? What the challenges are for this child but also knowing what the strengths of this child are. Every child have strengths. They have strengths. They have things that they are good at. They have skill sets that they are good with. And so identifying what those strengths are, asking your child, so what do you think? So given, so helping them to understand, right? So in life, Sometimes we have things that we cannot control. Sometimes we have things that we are able to control. This is a situation that a lot of what's happening is so much outside of our control. So I'm really big on validation. Um, so I think it's important to validate that, man, this is really hard. And, and naturally, I think in the educational system, we talk about how do you learn best, right? And this arrangement during the pandemic has created a system and a, and a way and, and a method of education where it's kind of forcing everyone to learn the same way, right? Or in the same, in the same setting, which is video, right? And so that's, that's a challenge. So validating that I, this is hard. This is really tough. And I know that you do so much well or so much better in this setting. And you like to talk, you know, have this interaction with your teacher and you like to, you know, talk to your friends and that just makes it so much easier for you. Um, so validating, encouraging in that way is really helpful in addition to reaching out. But I can't emphasize enough the importance of validating because the last thing you want to do as a parent is to make the child feel bad because that's just gonna make their performance probably sink even further because now they're gonna lose motivation and, and, and self-confidence. So with validation, what you do is you sustain the confidence because you're acknowledging that this is a unique situation 
And yes, things are different and things are much more challenging for you. You are still so smart. We just have to figure this out. So you tell me, what do you think it's gonna be best for you? So even though we can't change the pandemic, we can talk about what you think is best. I can't promise you that what you're telling me, we can always implement, but I can tell you that I'm gonna advocate for you. I'm telling you that I can do this for you, right? And now your language may be different if you're talking with a younger child versus an older child. With an older child, you may not step in as much. You may have a conversation that leads that child to speak up for themselves or send an email to their teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you're not doing, uh, you're not using the same language and not using the same exact approach. But generally speaking, either you're, you're advocating for the child and or you're helping the child to advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. If anyone, I think that's really important. Sure, absolutely. Anyone who's joining us this evening, if you have a question or a comment on something that we've said, or if you'd like us to, the doctor professionals, to address something that has not been said, please use the raised hand feature if you are on Zoom and uh, type your comment in the chat if you're on uh, uh, in the comment section, if you're on Facebook, uh, we will address that right away. I had a question and maybe I'm not sure if it was answered or not. If you have multiple children in the home, do you address the situation at the dinner table with all of the kids together? So how are you all doing today? Or do you pull them one by one? Or what would you recommend uh, in that regard? Because sometimes it's a dinner table. Let's all talk about how we feel today. Um, or is it more personal where you can give the child the opportunity to maybe address things one-on-one -on -one that they may not feel comfortable saying in front of a sibling? I think it's good that you asked that question, Gail, because I would go back to what you do normally, right? So some things don't have to work differently because of the pandemic. So if you, you know that, because everyone has a different personality type, right? What, what is helpful to one child is not helpful to the other right? What one child appreciates, the other is petrified over, right? So, so, so you have these different personalities. And so you go back to what you would normally do. Now, again, making the assumption that you normally had these conversations, that's what, that's, that's what be, you would just go, you would just keep that going, right? So if you know that one child feels more so called out when that conversation is had over the dinner table, and you know that normally you don't really, um, go as deep in the conversation with whatever problems or difficulties this one child is having, then don't start that process now, right? Because the child probably won't like it now, just like they didn't like it beforehand. However, if this is something new for you, right? Because a lot of this is new for families, right? Maybe some families, they never even had time to have dinner together because of work schedules, right? And sporting events, they were kind of just kind of seeing each other in passing, right? And now they're in a situation where they're always together <laughs> every single day, all day long. And so now they're kind of sitting there like, okay, so how does this, how is this supposed to work? <laughs> what yeah. do you all wanna talk about? Um, so if that's the case, then you just simply ask your children. So this is an open time, right? For us to discuss. I think that would be the best approach because if you didn't have a, a, a system in place beforehand, really what you're doing is you're, you're, you're probably learning your children in a way that you didn't even know before because the time just wasn't, or the opportunity just wasn't there. There wasn't the timing, the environment just wasn't what it is now. So you're really learning so in some cases, parents are learning their children in a much different way um, than what they have known their children previously. And so when you're learning somebody for the first time, you're not really pushy. You're just kind of open, right? You, you, set, you set the environment. I think that's the most important thing for parents to do is just have this open door policy, right? This open communication. So even if you're at the dinner table together, it doesn't mean that you have to call anyone out and say, so how are you doing in this area? How, what about this test? What about this grade? What can you do better? You're just opening the conversation. And so therefore, whoever jumps in, jumps in and you talk about it. Whoever doesn't jump in, then you keep mind of that. You keep note of that. And then maybe you circle back around and have that private conversation because you notice this one child was extremely quiet, right? When this open 
dialogue was happening. So you just circle back and then, and, and, and now you learn, okay, so this child, I know if things aren't going so well, they're not going to open up. They're not going to discuss it. They won't say anything at all. And I have to take that extra time and give them this extra attention or additional attention to make sure that I check in with them privately. And maybe you'll find that they'll open up and they'll be perfectly, you know, you know, comfortable with that. But so I'm going to jump in with reality um, at the dinner table. And this is something that you are not used to doing as a family. And you pose the question about, you know, how you're feeling. Suppose the older child has a feeling and they express it. Should we be concerned that our younger children will then uh, pick up on the feelings of the older and then become uh, affected, depressed, or more hear more than we would probably want them to if they would otherwise have been okay? Should we be concerned about that or... Um, how do you address something like yeah. that when there's an older influence? Either. Yeah. Well, well, I think we, no, I, I think you, you do run that risk. Um, but again, I think that um, we all can improve our communication, right? And in, in our family systems. And so if a child does hear something that they don't quite understand, um, as a parent, you don't have to jump right in to try to fix that. Kind of let it happen organically. If, if something is said, see what the older child's real perspective is of that. So maybe you can try to work to help them even problem solve it in the discussion. And then the child will also not only be hearing, uh, the younger child won't necessarily just hear that there's a problem, but how might we solve it? So not to just leave it out there at the table and say, okay, well, you and I will talk about that later. No, it's out there now. So, you know, try to engage your skills Pass the role. in that moment. <laughs> right, we're right. right. <laughs> you know, avoid, avoidance is an option, but not the best thing. Right. But, but at the point, you know, try to think, okay, if you're caught off guard like that, okay, think problem solved. You know, how do we solve this? And that's also about being curious when your child presents something or if they're troubled by something, ask them how do they, you know, what do you think we can do, you know, to, to, to find a solution to that or to this, or, you know, what would you suggest be done in this situation? And so it takes some of the responsibility off the parent, but it also models for both children that I won't always be sitting here. You're gonna have to do this at some point in your own anyway. Right, and so being able to do that um, is better than avoiding or trying to say, oh, you know, this is, you know, you shouldn't have brought it up because you don't wanna do that either. If you, if you open the forum for that, then you, you, are, you just have to be prepared for what comes. Mm -hmm. But another thing I would suggest is there's nothing wrong. We, we make plans to do all kinds of things. And especially for families who maybe have not done this all the time or not done it well, um, and even for ones who have, there's always the option to plan time to just sit and talk. And what you can do to really engage your children so it's non-threatening, you might have somewhat of an agenda, but let the children pick topics. Like, you know, we're going to meet every Friday and don't make it a three hour session. You know, if it, if it goes into that fine, but just like maybe carve out 30 to 45 minutes. It typically will go longer than that because if it goes well, everybody's talking and they're engaging, um, you know, have snacks, you know, do something that's again, non-threatening in that space, but maybe you can just have a child or a person and say, pick a topic for that day uh, or for that, for that particular meeting. And if it is dinner, fine. Um, if it's another time, but try to, it's okay to plan time to be together and, and have a focus for that time. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that might also, again, you might learn more about uh, what your children are thinking, what they're bothered by. Um, I'm always interested in what children are thinking, you know, about all of this, you know, about how, how we are handling this. You'd be surprised, even the youngest children have a take on what has happened with COVID-19. And so, you know, it's important to give them that kind of platform to express themselves. Right, and, and then maybe as, as we see necessary to be able to reframe, you know, things for them in a safe way if we have to. Um, but also again, just, just it, it, it's, it's all about creating a space again for everyone to learn what everybody's going through for our children, 
not just problem solving, but you know, really increasing autonomy with them and letting them know that even the youngest child, your opinion matters, how you feel matters, as well as our older children who sometimes isolate because they don't feel that they matter. Yeah, I'm and Chris, sure. can I say this too, Gail? Sure. Sometimes children don't need you to problem solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes they don't come to you because they feel like that's what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. You're talking to me directly, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, Gail. Yep, I get it. <laughs> I get it. You got a college age one, Gail, too. You know that. Right? I know. What does, that you doesn't matter that. anything to me. Right. <laughs> Still my baby. Yes. <laughs> And, and, and that's exactly how a lot of, you know, loving parents feel like if there is a situation that their children bring up, we want, because we want our children to be okay, right? Mm -hmm. We want them to be okay. We want them to be well, we want them to be happy. Um, but what we, what we don't realize is that sometimes if we're always solving all their problems, they don't learn and develop the skill set to solve it themselves. And so then even in our efforts to help, we are unintentionally crippling them. Mm -hmm. So I think going back to my statements before, validate, 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 listen, right? Sometimes, yes, of course, sometimes you will have to, you know, step in and help them problem solve. But just being open is my point. Be open to the idea of just listening, and understand that even in listening, you are still helping. And I'll now have you know I have improved in that category. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am listening. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes we can feel like if we don't give a suggestion or if we don't give an idea that we haven't helped, but sometimes we've helped the most when that's all that we do. And mm -hmm. they feel like we are a safe place for them to disclose their feelings and their fears and their thoughts um, too, because we, we just listen and we were just there. And sometimes they just need a sounding board. Mm -hmm. They just need to know that someone is there to listen, not to critique, not to try to solve the problem because it, it, take, it can also rob them of the confidence that they can do it themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we can interfere with their ability to develop the skill, but we can also interfere with their confidence level in doing that as well. And I know that some parents, you know, may feel like, well, how do I know when to do what? Right. right. Um, and, and, and I would say to that parent who may have a question like that is that you, 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 you allow your child to lead. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can just simply ask, is there anything that I can do to help? And your child may very well say, yes, like, I don't know what to do about this. And they'll just go and they'll tell you exactly what they need, right? And then sometimes your child may say, no, like, I don't really need you to do anything. I just needed to get that off my chest, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? I'm so let's jump in there and ask something because um, I do want to show or talk about when it's serious. Mm -hmm. So suppose you have a child and you ask what you ask Dr. Jackson and they say, I'm fine but you really deep down feel like that there's something serious going on. I don't, I mean, most of the time, I believe that, you know, our children are gonna be okay, but we have to address that there are times that, you know, children take it to that severe level and often parents regret. And I, I, I don't know how many children are listening, so I don't wanna say the, the, the severity that it can lead to. Um, what should parents do if they suspect anything that uh, could be a little bit more serious than maybe some of the things that we've talked about. Um, do so you jump right out and call for help or what do you do? If the parent truly feels like it is something serious, then I would say always err on the side of caution, right? Because if your child is upset with you because you overreacted, it's better for that to happen than for you to under, like not react at all and then now you don't have a child or you have a, you know, just the most extreme situation, com you know, comes to pass. So I would say it's definitely always better to, to go with what you are truly concerned. And because sometimes parents talk about, 
you know, I just had this feeling, right? We talk about this feeling, this unction, this, this, this nudge, this pull, this, this discomfort in our stomach. Like we just knew something was there. If that happens to you and you're, and you have, you have all these different things lined up and you're like, they're saying this, but they're doing this, mm -hmm. right? They're saying they're okay, but they are not talking anymore. They're, they're staying in their room. You know, they don't want to come out. They're much more irritable. They're arguing with me all the time. You know, what that, or, or, or they're much more passive than they used to. They, I started to see a change in their sleeping patterns or eating patterns. Like if you know that you've been keeping track, right? And you have this list of things that you've been noticing over time, but your child is still insisting that they are okay. I would say definitely respond to that. And I would, I would, I would say to the child, okay, listen, I am really concerned. This is what I've been noticing. So if it's nothing, then I, I need you to help me understand all the signs and symptoms that I'm seeing. Right. So, so allow them to explain to you what's been going on as well. So I would say definitely confront it. If you really feel like it's something serious, always confront it because you don't want to have regrets. You don't. And that's the time where it's not at the dinner table and, and you kind of confrontation. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, as a parent, you don't want to miss the opportunity to teach your child about um, being being concerned about their own well-being. Right. Because if we if we're afraid to address it with them, it's quite often that, that they they you know, we don't know what they've heard or, or what they've read or what they've seen. And so sometimes they may just not bring it up at all. But if we are seeing these things, you're right. We you you want you just you you take the hit for going in and being direct with your child. But again, I think it's important to make sure we're always encouraging them because, you know, we make the doctor's appointments off and we take them, we, you know, we tell them it's time for this, you know, for your uh, yearly exam, we tell them it's time, you know, this is a way to teach them to be really intuitive and thoughtful about their own well being and to attend to that. So if something's not right, to be able to say, you know, this doesn't feel right. So you can also use that time as an opportunity to teach them how important it is to, to really do that on their self-care that they need. Yes, and you can give them numbers. But if we're talking about teenagers, especially, you can For give sure. them resources. Yeah. You can give them the resources. Children, I believe 14 and older, they're able to make their own appointments. Yeah, they can. Without, without their parents' you know, permission, yeah. approval, consent they're able to do that on their own so if you really believe that there is something there going on serious with your child and your child is just adamant with you that it is nothing there is nothing going on you make the suggestions so let's schedule an appointment they say no they refuse refuse then you leave them with resources you you still continue to check in with them and you give them you provide them with resources you give them numbers to crisis lines, right? They, every, every, every county, I'm going to say that we're probably dealing with here, Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, right? Yeah. There, are, there are crisis numbers. There are community mental health facilities. So there is, there, 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 help is there. If they don't want to open up with you as a parent, there is help available. Um, and so you provide them with uh, those numbers so that they can reach out. Um, you let them know that you are concerned. You let them know, of course, how much you love them and you, you, you are concerned about them. I, I don't want to feel like I'm overreacting, but I want you to know that I love you and I'm concerned. And I've just been noticing these changes and these changes concern me, especially since you're not able to explain them to me. And I understand, right? So you start to have, you again, kind of like this very open, honest transparency as a parent, as a parent. Right. These are these are my concerns. And here's why I'm concerned. Right. And I understand if you don't want to talk to me, but here are some people that you can talk to. Right. You're not by yourself. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you just you let them know that there is help. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to add too. so for I'm sorry to cut you off for this will be good to bring up too for next week that um, also are, you know, the children are in school or they have been in school. Um, whether they're there in person or virtually, and we can't forget about school social workers, right? And, right? and people in the school system who are also there for our children, who are used to seeing our children every day, they're still on assignment. 
And then some of the schools have uh, school-based clinics where you may have a uh, nurse practitioners or some other kind of provider there, primary care provider, uh, again, social workers to be able to assist those children. So we don't wanna forget about um, those other outlets. And then as uh, Dr. Jackson mentioned, in Michigan, we are, our children, for, it is 14 and up, um, where they're able to schedule their own appointments. And that's not just primary care, that's also mental health. Right. That we can schedule mental health appointments without a parent's permission here in the state of Michigan. See that provider have the same types of uh, give their own consent and be subject to the same terms of confidentiality up to a point. There are some limits for confidentiality, um, but but there, like she mentioned, there are tons of resources. So as parents, you know, we we can possibly you know just get yourself a list. Look in your county and start pulling off the list of providers in your area and definitely tap into their, to the school system. We have about 15 more minutes. I wanna go um, on the other end of the spectrum and I'm not sure if we had that included in our description talking about small children. And I'm only bringing this up because um, I don't go that many places, but when I go to the grocery store, I often notice, and I, it doesn't take much for me to tear up about it, when I have on my mask or sometimes it's a shield or sometimes it's whatever, and the little two and three and four and five-year-olds are in the little buggy and they stare, is this doing anything to them mentally? Because they're so small and this is what they see as human, everyone covered. Um, sometimes I just want to take off my face mask and smile at the child because I'm smiling behind the mask, but all they can see are eyes, if that. And it's, it's just, how much should we be concerned about our little ones? Um, how are they processing this? Or sh what age is old enough to say something about it? Or do you just kind of make it, let's come on, put on the little mask. You know, what is it doing to them mentally, the younger children? Any way you would like to approach that? or even the parent, what do we do with that? Uh, you go ahead, Dr. Jackson. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think that's all okay, children in your to area of expertise, but I don't know. I just see that and I think, oh my goodness, poor babies. I, I think that, okay, so the question of what is it doing to them mentally? Um, I think we'll know that with additional research, mm -hmm. the extent of the impact I don't know if we know that now, other than um, using the information we have um, as professionals in the field. And we know that um, every environment has an impact, right? So everything that happens in any environment, whether it's COVID-19 or not, children are picking up and they're making associations. They're making links. These neurotransmitters are connecting. Um, and, and they're making neural pathways, right? So those things are forming in their brain, especially when you mentioned two and three, I think it's two and three. The brain doesn't develop any faster or, 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 or more, more connections are made during that span of time, those years in particular than any other time. Um, and I, we, so we know that there's going to be impact. What is the extent, I don't think we can really honestly answer that question until we get more research out there and start to see what that impact really is. Now, what can we do or what would we suggest that parents do with little ones like that? I think that the good thing is that in the home setting, masks are not being worn, right? So they still are able to see smiling faces, happy, you know, emotion and affect. Um, reading, reading social cues um, a lot at home. So they're, they're not missing that as much um, because they're still getting that inside the home setting. And I think that that's an important thing to remember. And also the resiliency factor with, with mm -hmm. children are just naturally so high that I think we can't forget that aspect as well, that even though they are being raised um, in the beginning years in this type of condition, that they will naturally have the capacity to, uh, most of them, a lot of them, I think, to bounce back and recover and move on and have and live normal, um, healthy lives, you know, mentally as well. Um, so I don't know, honestly, if there is any, re uh, enough research out there right now for us to answer specifically the question that you're asking. But I do think that having children involved in the Zoom sessions and being able to see the smiling faces and still learning social cues, I think is really important right now because you don't want them to miss that development, um, that developmental skill. 
um, which can be lost when you're, if, if they were really around people all day long with masks on, I think that would be a bigger issue. But the fact that we would assume that in most households, you're not walking around in um, masks all day, I don't think that we are as concerned about them having impairment with their ability to develop appropriate communication and social skills mm -hmm. um, just because of wearing masks temporarily when they're outside the home. My next question I wanted to ask, and once again, it's probably off guard, I don't know if it's your area of specialty, but um, children with special needs, mm -hmm. um, that's a whole nother thing to deal with in and of itself. What do you say to a parent who's dealing on with a child with special needs trying to adjust um, during the pandemic? Is there anything that you can say? I don't even know what to ask for that, but can you address that? Well, I, that's not my area of specialty, but I can say this is the, 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 the time that, that you have to seek out uh, mm -hmm. professionals. You don't have a choice. Um, again, as Dr. Jackson mentioned earlier, it's just like with your, how you dealt with your child when they were in school or whatever programming they were in, you know, take the same steps. You're going to reach out to those professionals, um, either who have serviced your children before. Um, I do know that if for our state, and I can say that there have been some great steps taken mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. really fill in the gaps and to really provide the right amount of support for parents, especially with children with, with special needs. So the, the best you can do is just reach out to the, the typical entities that you would have, either the ones you've been dealing with. Um, there are other organizations. Um, again, I try not to, you know, depend so much on, on uh, Google and everything else, but Google's a great thing. Right, you know, there, haven't we learned that more now? <laughs> there are organizations out there that are have have opened up their uh, services completely virtual. They have a, a completely virtual platform now um, to maybe help parents. Like if you're not getting it here in the state of Michigan, um, in terms of getting direction of how you need to, you know, better assist your child, either whether it's with schooling um, or with some kind of programming to keep them engaged during the day. There are some options out there online, but definitely you don't have an option here, but to engage with the professionals uh, who have either serviced your children before or the different types of program. You can also talk with the state, um, you know, Department of Health and just find out what resources are available to you there. Mm -hmm. I have another question just popped in and I can't see it. So let me look. Oh, okay, there I can see it. Uh, do either of you feel like the Zoom squares could cause mental health issues? Many kids have their cameras off during school so kids don't see their friends and teachers don't see their students. That was uh, a question from Facebook. The Zoom squares. Gail, is it possible for the person, Katie, to take herself off mute so I can get a better understanding of that question versus her typing it in, especially since we just have about, you know, eight minutes or so left? Katie, can you hear us? Are you willing to do that? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, it was, this was an anonymous question, so I'm not sure about a deeper meaning behind it. Um, yeah, so it says, do you feel like like referring square. to how like if kids turn their cameras off and there's just they can't see other faces I guess not being able to I think she's talking um the the person is talking about when you turn your camera off like how I just have oh I guess off. like we're looking at just not looking at faces yeah, actually they're not seeing faces the blank squares that name how is that impacting them mentally mm -hmm. I guess that's what they're saying I think that I think that I think that any I think that because so my answer here would be slightly different than the younger children because the younger children like two and three they're not in well, some of them are some of them are in daycare but some are not but if they're in daycare they're around people they're having the human interaction I believe our governor left daycare facilities open so that would encompass those two year olds and three year olds that are that that are that are going um, so they're still able to get that human interaction that face to face. The social cues. I think my biggest concern is, I guess I would question if we're talking about younger children, I, I guess I would be thinking about, okay, so now there's no, there's even less human interaction. There's the voice, right? Inflection, you can hear that, but you're, you're losing the ability to, again, gain that, that social interaction and those social communication skills. And I think it could be talking about maybe a little older kids. I know mom. Yes, we have, um, I have more clarification. It's for middle and high school students. 
Oh, okay. Thank you. So I that. guess it's when they're learning and cameras are off and they just hear voices and blank squares. How well, is that affecting? Yeah. Well, I can you know, I can say I, most of that, and, and again, this is where we don't want to make an assumption. Most of that is that they just don't want to be on the screen. You know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a mental health thing. You know, um, if I was trying to read this question two ways, like we don't know in terms of being in this type of system, like I said, the research has not been done. Um, we don't know what this can cause like neuropsych neuropsychologically later on. We don't know any of that. Um, but for many kids who are opting out of, of being on the screen, one, it's because it's an option. And two, early in the morning, some of them would rather just lay in the bed and listen to the <laughs> instruction. <laughs> you know, it, it's because they can't, unless you are in a class and where a teacher enforces that. Um, but I don't know that we can say that, um, that it would maybe cause any real issues. Um, it could be other reasons why they don't want to be on screen. But from what I have seen, even with my older ones, it, it's just, it's an option and we just rather not. Even with adults, if I right now say, okay, everyone who's watching, turn your cameras on, I probably, maybe yeah. I'll get one or two, but not likely. <laughs> I think we're winding down. How much more time? We have just a few more minutes left um, in our discussion, but I do want to talk about the ones that we have coming up. The next one will be January 7th, talking about, we did mention, it's supporting frontline workers and educators and how, how much we need that one as well. Um, Dr. Jackson, you will be joining us, us for that one. I put you on the spot before. I'll put you on the spot again. Um, you want to kind of give a little teaser about what we're going to talk about in, in that? Well, I think I think next week's session is so uh, important and, and, it, and, and it, it acknowledges the impact of the pandemic and the unique situation that our healthcare workers are in and that our teachers are in. And so going back to this idea of validating people and their experiences, I think this um, format for them specifically does exactly that. It acknowledges that they are in such a unique situation and in, a, in such a unique position that it is worthy and it is extremely important for us to attend to what their unique situation is, how it's different from other workers or positions and careers and what their needs may be and what some of their challenges are during this time that may be very unique and different from any other person's uh, challenges during this time. So I think it is such a great um, platform for us to have to discuss uh, the frontline workers. Very good. And once again, that date will be January 7th at 6.30 p.m. So uh, log on to our website, novilibrary.org to get the Zoom link for it. Or once again, it will be on Facebook Live as well. And then the one following that, I think this one's going to be interesting. It's Man Stress, You're Not Alone. That's January the 14th. You know, trying to get that men to express themselves is in and of itself a challenge, right? Am I being stereotypical when I say that? But um, <laughs> no. just to add that, but to understand that they are dealing with a lot too, you know, um, Okay, I'm stereotypical, but women, we feel comfortable saying, blah, 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 we're doing this, blah, 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 blah. But the man, however, may not always feel that comfortable. And uh, we want to set up a, a place and a platform and a space for that. We will have a male, I said, is social worker? Is he a social worker? Yes. I'm calling yes. all these titles wrong. He's a social yes. worker. So we will yes. have uh, Dr. Crystal and also a male social worker who will be joining us to address that topic. So if you have husbands and sons or whatever uncles whatever that will join in and listen to that i hope uh, for it to be beneficial to them and what they're dealing with you want to tease that a little bit too dr Jackson? well i think so i think i just want to say that joe Lilly is a licensed uh, master level social worker and he has had um not only of course yes he is a male but he has held uh men groups uh groups specifically for men to discuss their unique um issues that they have um and being able to help them to resolve some of their unique situations and uh, presenting concerns. So I think he is such a valuable asset. He will be such a valuable asset with a, just a great amount and wealth of knowledge um, that he can help. Um, whether it's men who are listening or whether it is uh, women who are listening who can mm -hmm. help and be, and be able to learn more about what the men in their lives are going through and being able to be a better support system for them 
um, I think it's going to be helpful um, across the board. Mm -hmm. Very good. And once again, that one it will be January 14th at 6.30 p.m. So you can log on to register for that one. And that's it one for the one about kids. We did it. Huh? We hope you um, got something out of what we said. I hope you were encouraged and inspired um, that you can make it. Your kids will make it. We'll all get through this pretty soon. It's going to be over, right? We're, we're all keeping hopeful and keeping uh, the faith that this will all end successfully and our children will be fine. I want to thank you, Dr. Jackson. I want to thank you, Kristen, very much. Your names are in the chat and contact information should you want to contact either of them um, for consultation, whatever you want, if uh, they can help direct you for any type of help that you need. Um, their information is there. If you are on Facebook and you don't have it, you can email me G Anderson at novilibrary.org and I can uh, give you their contact information if you so desire. But thank you both for joining us. And any closing 30 second remarks because we kind of started late. No, Gail, fine. just thank you for having this platform for yeah. us. I think it's fantastic um, that you've allowed us to have these type of meaningful discussions. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you, Katie, so much for your help. Everyone have a good night. See you thank next time. You. Take care. Bye. Talk to you, Dr. Jackson. Bye. That's it.